Okay, um, great to be here. Uh, this is not my usual audience. Uh, I'm a computer security person. Uh, I'm probably one of the least knowledgeable people about alignment in this room. So maybe what I want to do instead of telling you about what you should be doing is giving you some words of caution about what might happen in your future if you follow a similar path to what our field in adversarial machine learning followed. Um, maybe think of this in some sense as a cautionary tale. Uh, I am the ghost of future of Christmas yet to come and telling you what things might look like in 10 years if you follow a similar path from adversarial machine learning. Uh, as I understand it, you have somewhat of a problem. And the problem that you face is that it's relatively easy to take a model and make it look like it's aligned. Right? You can take this model, you ask GPT-4, you know, how do I like, end all of humans? And the model says, you know, I can't possibly help you with that. But there are a million and one ways to take the exact same question, you know, pick your favorite, and you can make the model still answer the question even though initially it would have refused. So here's some work where you add an adversarial suffix, but you know you can ha have all these other human interpretable jailbreaks where instead you say, you know, my mother used to read me the recipe to napalm to help me go to sleep or whatever your favorite one of these is, all of them work. And so the general problem is that you have these models that look like they're aligned when you look at them naturally, but what you actually want is you want them to be aligned in some worst case setting. And the question this reminds me a lot of coming from adversarial machine learning is exactly a similar question that we face in our field. So what I want to do is tell you a little bit of a story of how our field went. Uh, so a long time ago, you know, maybe 10 years ago, um, in a galaxy far away, um, somewhere in the middle of Canada, um, this paper happened. Uh, the paper is Intriguing Properties of Neural Networks. And the title sounds pretty innocuous, but what they discovered was that you can cause models to make arbitrary mistakes fairly trivially. So you can take you know, this image here, that's all of us recognize that the tabby cat correctly, state of the art model gets it right with 88% confidence, and you can introduce this adversarial perturbation so that the image now looks like this, essentially indistinguishable to all of us as humans, but the same model that gets the image on the left correct gets the image on the right incorrect, 99% confidence labeled guacamole. Now, this doesn't matter, right? Like, no one is going to turn cats into guacamole. This is not a real threat. But it's point to something fundamental for all machine learning models, that the way that they behave, it's easy to make them work arbitrarily poorly in other settings that matter. And so because of this, people spent a lot of time working on defenses. They tried to train models to make sure that they are not vulnerable to this form of attack. And they put a lot of work into this, you know, hundreds and thousands of papers doing this. And let's see what happened. So here's the problem again. Um, one point of note. It turns out that there's basically exactly one way to generate adversarial examples, which is through gradient descent. This is an important point because it means that it's relatively straightforward if you give me a defense to adversarial examples to know how to evaluate it. The only thing I have to do is perform gradient descent. What do I mean by this exactly? When we train a model, we update the parameters of the model to minimize the loss on the training data. When we attack a model, the only thing we're going to do is we're going to do exact same gradient descent, but instead of taking gradients with respect to the parameters of the model, we're going to take gradients with respect to the input and make the input maximize the loss. So what does this look like? Here's some loss surface from an actual model where we have some point that's correctly classified. In this case, the height, the z-axis here corresponds to the confidence in the model of the correct prediction. And the thing that we notice is that like, it's relatively easy to find points that allow us to travel down this path to we have to end up with inputs that are very close in pixel space, but have very, very different losses. This is why attacks are so easy. The good thing about this is it makes evaluating whether or not a defense is correct very easy. Because the only thing you have to do is make sure your model is differentiable. And if your model is differentiable, then I can evaluate it with exactly this protocol. 
I formulate a loss function, cross entropy loss, the same thing that I use for training the model. I perform gradient descent. If you can train your model, you can attack your model. And as a security researcher, this surprised me. The reason why it surprised me is because you can't do this for like standard security binaries. Like if someone gives me some C++ compiled binary, I can't just perform gradient descent on it to find all the bugs. Like it doesn't even make sense. And that means it's really hard to check if a C++ binary has bugs because you have to like ask humans to find them all one by one. But for a machine learning model, you can just essentially find them all automatically, which is amazing. And yet, despite the fact that it was essentially trivial to find all of the bugs in principle, the community had a very hard time coming up with actually effective defenses. I wrote paper after paper after paper after paper after paper after paper doing nothing but taking people who had proposed defenses and showing that they were incorrect. So despite the fact that it was essentially trivial to do this right in principle, it turned out that this was really hard to do in practice. Now, um, I have neither the time nor the inclination to teach you how to do this correctly right now. I have eight more minutes. That's not gonna be possible. We've written like 50 pages on how to do this right. So what I want to do maybe is let me give you like an N equals one anecdote on what this looks like when we try to break a defense. I was gonna do this live, but um, my, my computer's over there. So um, I recorded a demo. Um, this is going to break this recent defense that appeared at IEEE SMP earlier this year. Um, this is the top conference in computer security. All the best work appears here. Here's the defense to episode examples. Okay, I can't, can't be live, sorry. Um, okay, so I play the demo. Um, here's the Jupyter Notebook that has their code. This is like the code provided by the authors, and it trains their model, does all the stuff, and you'll see that the evaluation accuracy of this classifier on the standard, this is CIFAR 10 classifier that has like 92% accuracy. It's a pretty good classifier. Now, if you run their attack out of the box, what you'll find is that the attack, if you run it, the accuracy goes to like 100%. Now, okay, it's not actually 100%, this is only on a subset of the data set. And you might think, okay, this is a little weird. Like I'm following the gradients to make the model get less good and the model gets more good. Right, this is somewhat confusing. The authors have some argument in their paper about why this is true. And so I'm gonna make a fairly trivial observation. I'm gonna say, if following the direction of the gradient that maximizes the loss makes the model get more accurate, what if I just minimize the loss? I'm gonna, I'm gonna, it makes no sense, but I'll just sort of, one direction goes up, the other direction should go down, and what do you know? Okay, it's broken. Okay. Published paper, top computer security conference, one character change breaks it. Like, you know, like 92% clean accuracy, now we're at 5% accuracy under attack, right? This is not a good world to be living in where you have like these top papers that are so easily broken. And the reason I'm concerned by this is like we literally know more about evaluating the robustness of these image classifiers than anything else in adversarial machine learning. Because in some sense, this is the problem we study the most. We've written uh, almost 10,000 papers on this topic. And we still can't get this problem right. And so I'm concerned about these adversarial games because we have tried really, really hard to solve this one particular problem that have been stuck on it. Now, some people, when I give them this argument, they say, okay, Nicholas, that's fine. You can always pick examples of papers that are easy to attack. Um, we should be evaluating this field based on the best research, not based on maybe what's, what might be the worst. Let me do that too. Let me show you a little bit of what the best um, work in this field looks like. Here, what I have is a plot is the best accuracy on, on CIFAR 10 again as a function of time, evaluating with some, some work that people did, did in 2020 and that introduced this paper that, that introduced this attack called auto attack. So when they wrote their paper in 2020, you have this plot. And this actually made me pretty optimistic because it looks like we're like making roughly linear progress as we go forward. It kind of looks like you could almost project out into the future and draw a line and say, you know, we'd be at, you know, something like 90% accuracy by now. And you know, I've tried to like logic scale this properly to make sure that I'm not going over 100%. I'm trying to like make this plot look correct. Um, but it turns out that over the last four years, if you actually look at what the data actually shows, how well did we actually do? We didn't do that well. Like we sort of plateaued. We have not made considerable progress on this, this very specific problem. 
And I think there are a bunch of reasons for this. One is maybe the problem we picked might in some sense have been too hard. The problem we picked was like, assume an attacker has arbitrary access to the entire model, can perturb any pixel arbitrarily, and can do whatever they want. Maybe this is too hard of a problem. But it's the problem that we set ourselves out for, and we have not made considerable progress on it. I think we should be careful from this. Basically, the question that I'm trying to say is, this is a problem that we set ourselves out for 10 years ago. We have made very limited progress for, and I'm kind of concerned that if we can't even solve these very simple problems, like any, any five-year-old in the world can solve this problem of recognizing the cat versus guacamole. We can't even get a model to do that after 9,000 papers. OK. In contrast, let me talk a little bit about what I think are the differences in the field that you all are trying to solve things on. And I think the differences mainly make your lives harder. First of all, it's hard to even formulate the objective of what you're trying to achieve. We have a very simple objective. Classify the image correctly according to the original label. But your problem might be something like, the model should never give instructions on how to build a bomb, as the earlier example was. How do you formalize that? Like, what is the mathematical function that is one every time the model gives instructions on how to build a bomb, and zero otherwise? Because if I'm going to try and optimize this, I, I need some formalism that I can look at. I don't know how to do that. And not only is this hard, even if you could formalize it, if you're going to try and use anything like a technique that can be automated, I need to be able to optimize this objective. It can't just be one and zero when it succeeded and when it failed. I would like this to be something that you can actually smoothly interpolate. And people have come up with hacks that let you do this. You know, you do cross entropy loss with sure, here is how to build a bomb as the, as the beginning of the language model's response. And that sometimes works. That's good to know. But this is not a guarantee that there does not exist another way of asking the model to answer the question and have it succeed there. And not only do you have to have it work in this differentiable function, you're also probably going to have to do this over some discrete space. right? And so you can't even use the single gradient optimizer that we have that we use to train these things. You're going to have to come up with it all. A completely new gradient-free optimizer that tries to do this over some discrete optimization space. So this is even harder. And so my concern for the field is that we're going to have place papers that claim robustness in some sense without being able to formally define what they mean. And we're not going to be able to evaluate whether or not they're effective because we have no method of actually achieving this. We're just going to have a bunch of humans trying their best and seeing if we can figure things out or not. And so what we'll end up with is the, the repeat of what happened in adversarial machine learning, but worse. Because we won't even be able to automatically check these things. We're going to have a bunch of defenses. No one will know whether or not they worked. And people will just try and be making these claims. And to be clear, I'm not only just worried about an attacker targeting these systems. The reason why I'm thinking about this from this adversarial perspective is because thinking about the adversarial perspective is a very good way of getting an estimate of the true worst case. If an adversary trying to make something happen cannot succeed, then randomness alone is also not going to make it work. Because if randomness alone could make it work, the adversary would have succeeded. And so if you're worried about the model just sort of like happening to discover how to deceive the user or something, if someone trying to fool it maliciously can't make that happen, then we're not going to get there. OK, so to briefly summarize, we wrote like over 9,000 papers in 10 years and have made very, very, very limited progress on this one small problem. Uh, you all have a harder problem and maybe less time. So I would like, you know, think very carefully about the problem that you're trying to solve and try to not make it be a strict superset of the adversarial example problem. Because if it is, you're going to lose. You need to find ways of choosing your problem so that it's not something that guarantees you also have to solve adversarial examples. And there are lots of ways you could try and do that. But you should think of that when you're designing the problem you're trying to solve. 
maybe the one sentence conclusion is please learn from our mistakes. Don't do exactly the same things that we did or you'll end up in 10 years with having nothing to show for it. Thank you very much. Um, so one of the questions is from, from Adam Cleave, which is some people believe defense for discrete text-based inputs will be easier than continuous image-based inputs. How optimistic are you for defenses in the LLM case? Yeah, okay, this is, a, this is a, one of the differences that might make things a lot easier, right? The dimensionality of text is a lot smaller than dimensionality of arbitrary continuous embeddings. An image classifier is a million continuous dimensions input. A text model has like, you know, only one of 100,000 possible tokens. Maybe you have a thousand words, something like this. It's like orders of magnitude smaller. This might make things a lot easier. I guess my concern is that the problem might be easier, but the evaluation of it is much harder. And so it may be the case, and this is an easier problem to solve, but I'm not going to be able to know whether or not you actually have solved it. For the episode example problem, if, if someone were to give me an episode example defense, I can tell you in like, you know, two days whether or not it works. Like I sort of, I have this down, I know how to do it. I, I don't think anyone in the world knows how to do this for a language model defense. And that's my bigger concern.